greatest allies, we live in a time where you can check on your phone. So pull out your phone. Pardon me? It's okay. Let, let, her, let, her, let her go. Uh, I'm, we're gonna. We're gonna. T okay. Tell me. Has in fact shown you all the statistics that you claim are untrue. What you say about the Southern Democrats is not unknown. I am in fact an immigrant like you. I come from the same country that you come from, and I. I am not here to debate Democrat versus Republican. I am simply disappointed because you are producing facts that are simply not true. Name one. And you are not, and you are not a historian. For example, the party realignment, there, you should just go check your own Twitter page. This has been- Believe I, me, I have. Yes, yeah, so have I. So have I. Yeah. And I can see that you've been missing. Okay, let's pause. Let, let, let me, we need to situate what you're talking because you're making, um, you're making references here that need to be brought out. There is a historian at Princeton named Kevin oh, Cruz. And Cruz and I have been having a, a kind of a Twitter fight, if you will, about Dixiecrats. Now, Cruz plays a very sly game. He counts as Dixiecrats people who are not Dixiecrats. And so if I say to him, only two racist Dixiecrats became Republicans, he goes, what about John Tower? What about Jesse Helms? What about Trent Lott? And my response is, don't be an idiot. We're talking about Dixiecrats. None of those were. He cannot be an idiot. I'm not, hold on. He, he, he literally, this is literally his research. It's not his research. He, 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 has, he has written one book on white flight in Atlanta. Hold on. Hold on. Let's. Guys, hold on, hold on. Uh, I, I think what he's trying to say is that somewhat like the illegal, you want to jump the line. Um, and no, 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 hold on. Hold on. I, no. Don't shout, don't, don't shout. Well, don't, don't heckle me. One second. First of all, first of all, I was the person who said, let her speak. No, I didn't cut her off. Okay. All right. Uh, hold on. I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to do one more thing. And that is, is there anybody who's in the audience that wants to ask me a question about the posters on the campus? Because I... If they do, I'm happy to directly address. I obviously can't address. There was a kind of a blizzard of things out there. Some of them actually not even said by me. But nevertheless, if anyone wants to take a shot, I think it's kind of a nice way to close the evening. If one person wants to ask a question related to, oh, this guy, okay, he's ready. And we'll, we'll pick him as a representative of the resistance. Okay, go for it. Go for it. About your, you know, you worked in the Reagan administration, obviously, uh, for a while. I want to read you a quote from your former boss. It says, talking about immigrants in speech, they brought with them courage, ambition, and the values of family, neighborhood, work, peace, and freedom. And then he goes on to talk about how, like, immigrants are making this country great, and then he says, make America great again. I'm wondering what your own former boss would say about you now. So the question is, Quoting Reagan, my hero, and a lot of the reason I became a conservative, about how immigrants are entrepreneurial, hardworking, pro-family, and the, the question, and I just, want to, I just want to excavate the buried assumption of the question, how disappointed your former boss would be in you now. Now, I would submit that nobody would ask a question like that who actually was listening to what I said tonight. I actually believe that immigrants are hardworking, industrious, entrepreneurial. Uh, I said I would like to see the number of legal immigrants in this country increased. I would like to see our immigration policy modified to take far more of those kinds of immigrants. My position on immigration is thoroughly and completely Reaganite. Now, what 
gets me is when I hear things that revolt against what I know and also against common sense. And so there are things that people will sometimes say, like immigrants created this country and built this country. True, but only partially true, because that distinction confuses actually two groups that are not the same, immigrants and settlers. Colonizers. Settlers. Colonizers. colonizers, if you will. Okay. Colonizers, okay, let's call them colonizers. Colonizers. Here's the important thing. Colonizers create... Genocide. Why are you shouting? Don't, hold on. It's not, we can, we can have a whole debate on that. But let, let, me, let me address your point. Colonizers create the country that immigrants want to come to. Think of that paradox right there. In other words, if the colonizers were such horrible guys and have done such a botched up job of creating this country, why on earth today do immigrants from all over the world still want to come here? Why do we even have to talk about a wall in the knowledge that if we didn't have a wall, half the world would come here. What was it about those colonizers, despite their colonization, that was so powerful that 150 years later, the country that they made is still the magnet for the world? So immigrants like me will jump over fences, stand in lines, pay a lot of money, abandon our families to come to the country the colonizers made. <clears throat> Now, we're, all right, let's make this the last question in fairness and I will have extended the time. Go for it. It's your, the mic is yours. If that's the case, that the colonizers have created this wonderful country for people, why is it that the very descendants of the people that lived here before colonizers came in are the ones that are almost the most marginalized in this country and systematically suffering because of that? Yes. I, I'll try to answer that as best I can. The condition of the American Indians, historically, we have to look at it twofold, historically and today. Historically, it was the Indian Wars, the broken treaties by the white man, the uh, wounded knee, the battles, the massacres. It was also a, a plethora of diseases that spread through the Indian population brought by the white man, um, and that decimated the American Indian population. It was also you know, intentionally introduced, right? Uh, no, th no, that, that's not true. Uh, there's a debate about Jeffrey Amherst, and there's a controversial episode there. But look, diseases, there's a book by, I recommend to you by the historian William McNeil. It's called Plagues and Peoples. It talks about how massive populations have been decimated historically by diseases brought by outsiders. For example, the Black Plague in Europe killed one third of the entire continent, brought from Asia unintentionally. Now, I'm not gonna say that's genocide because genocide implies a deliberate intention to exterminate an entire population. That's why the use of the term genocide is very irresponsible on your part in this case. Be you don't think so. You think that, you think, and, and, and I'm gonna ask you now for your evidence, that there was a conscious intention to wipe out the Indian, Indians as a people. Sure. Chapter and verse, let's hear it. So, what do you say about the, the very thing that this, this institution was initially founded on about essentially whitewashing the, the Native Americans? And then that was, of course, abandoned, but all of these things. But what do you say about like the, the foundational thing for, for Indian schools that were created and then there were things about headhunting Indians and prizes for that? Money, like there was a clear incentivization by both the US government and just by people to be able to take over the property, well, you know, the, the land, the, the, the things that people had here before the colonizers came. So Eliezer Wheelock leaves Yale and comes up here into the woods of New Hampshire to set up a college to Christianize and educate the native Indians. Are you saying that he wanted to exterminate them? It's based in something else. So it has to do with you know understanding culture and whether or not you can actually you know help someone by Christianizing them. Right, but pause for a moment because because see part of part of education is making distinctions, right? Let's say I were to, let's say I believe as a Christian that your life would be infinitely better than it is 
if you became a Christian. And in that sincere belief, I read the Bible to you and I start proselytizing you. I'm not Adolf Hitler. You may not go for it. You may think that, uh, that I'm, I'm conning you.